It was a great pleasure to come to Forum 2015 to give the keynote today. The themes of my talk were really what does a good death mean and what do we need to do in order to be able to achieve that. And when I say we, I mean we as in the medical profession, but also we society, what should society do in order to help um, achieve the aims of a good death for the most people. So I think the key thing is that a good death means different things to different people. So there's no one size fits all. It's absolutely personal and a key aspect to achieving a good death is to talk to that person who's dying and find out what they want. But we can generalise a little bit. Um, several research studies around the world have asked that question, what would a good death mean to you? If you were faced with a terminal illness, what would be your priorities and preferences? And actually the results of all of these studies have been pretty consistent. Most people, if faced with a terminal illness, they want to be comfortable, so pain-free, in a place of their choosing, which is usually their home, and usually away from the paraphernalia of medical intervention. They want to be somewhere that's peaceful and dignified rather than somewhere that's very busy. Um, for most people, they want to be at home, but there's a big problem really at the moment, which is that mo most people in Ireland and in England, and actually a lot of places around the world, most people die in hospitals, and only about 20% of people currently die at home. So we are able, through the use of national death registries, so using death certificate data, which is a legal requirement, so it's collected for everyone who dies, we're able to analyse that data at a national level to look at where people die, look at how place of death changes over time, and also um, look into details about who is being supported to die at home and which groups of people are dying in other places, for example, hospitals and hospices. So one of the pieces of research I've done very recently was looking at all deaths in inpatient hospice units over 20 years in England. We included data on over 400,000 deaths and we looked at who those people were and how that had changed over time. Well, one of the headlines was that we found that the vast majority of people who die in hospices, they have cancer, even though for many, many years we've been promoting this message that Specialist palliative care isn't just about cancer, it's not just about your diagnosis, it should be about your need. Well, nevertheless, 95% of people who die in hospices have cancer, whereas we know that the majority of people who die do not have cancer. So there's one inequality based on diagnosis. But that one was perhaps not very surprising. What was really surprising was we looked at deprivation levels. Um, so we looked at the deprivation of the area that the people lived in, their place of residence. And we found that if you go back 20 years, people were always slightly more likely to die in an inpatient hospice unit in England if they lived in a richer area than a poor one. But what we found is that over 20 years, that gap between rich and poor actually increased. So you, we are even more likely now to die in an inpatient hospice unit than if we live in a rich area, than if we live in a poor area, suggesting that that inequality really is growing and we need to do something to tackle that. So in terms of reversing that inequality, I mean, that is a, that's a huge, thing to try and tackle and we can try from within palliative care, we can try and raise awareness and um, perhaps among the more deprived populations about what palliative care can offer. So there's some research in the past that has shown that people who live in the more deprived areas, they have a sense that hospice care isn't really for them. It's hospice care is considered quite middle class and I think that sort of comes back to its roots and fundraising and volunteering. So there's a there's quite a lot we can do from within palliative care to try and open the doors. But I think ultimately, we also need to have politicians and policymakers on side directing policies towards the more deprived. So um, I think I've seen data in Ireland up to maybe 2011 or 2012, and the trend is still towards lower home deaths. Actually, in England, that trend has reversed. So between about 2004 and 2006, we started to see the trend to reverse and home deaths have started to go up, hospital deaths have started to go down, which is really encouraging. Now, 
using these big national data sets, we can't determine exactly why that reversal in trend has occurred. But we can come up with ideas. And what happened at exactly that time was that we had our national end-of-life care strategy and the national end-of-life care framework, both of which had a huge focus on on supporting people to die out of hospital. So it makes sense, we feel, that those strategies really did have a tangible effect in terms of supporting people to die out of hospital. It's so difficult, isn't it? And part of what I spoke about in my um, talk was how now people are living longer and increasingly having lots of different complex comorbidities death is becoming more complex and actually more uncertain. So many deaths now are, have ups and downs, the trajectory changes. It's not certain that a patient is going to die within a few weeks, it's often very uncertain. Part of the message, I think, is about trying to open up conversations in society between families, carers and their loved ones about what they would want if ever they got or when they got to that stage, particularly if there were issues around um, capacity and cognitive function. So making sure that people know what you might want and also opening up that conversation between doctors and patients. It's really hard because we are trained to do life-saving, to treat and fix and cure. There's not very much emphasis in our training on, well, what if? What if things don't go well? What should we do in that situation? But actually more and more I think that that it is a very sensible strategy. The difficulty is finding the time for it. We work in very, very time poor, constrained environments. And actually these, this sort of communication um, towards the end of someone's life, it's not a, an event, it doesn't happen once, it's a process. It requires time and it requires continuity. And they're two things which we have very little of. Thank you.